Welcome to our live webinar titled Treating Infectious Diseases After Transplant. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lee Clark, patient educator, and I will be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I'd like to recognize the generous support of Bristol Myers Squibb, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Agios, and Genentech, and the generous support of our patients families, and caregivers for supporting the webinar program today. Due to the high volume of teleconferences on the internet, it is possible you may lose your connection during the webinar. If you are unable to view the webinar online, you can call in to hear the audio portion of the program using the call-in number in your reminder email. Today's program will be archived to our website within two to three business days. You will be notified by email when it is live and ready for viewing. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. To submit a question or comment, open the Q&A window in the lower part of your screen. Type your question in the small text box window, and when you have finished typing, just hit enter. We will do our best to get to all questions today. When submitting questions, I respectfully ask you do two things to help us manage the incoming questions. First, submit your entire question all at the same time. Second, please do not share private health information in your question. Our speakers cannot answer any specific questions related to your health care. Today's specialist, are Dr. Vaija Bhatt and Dr. Andrea Zimmer. Dr. Bhatt is an associate professor and the medical director of the leukemia program at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Zimmer is an associate professor and the medical director of the Oncology Infectious Disease Program at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. With that said, welcome Dr. Bhatt, welcome Dr. Zimmer. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. So we are going to discuss uh, the topic treating infections after transplant. I'd like to thank Aplastic Anemia MDS International Foundation and Lee and Julie for organizing this webinar. Thank you to our guest for joining this webinar despite these difficult times. And before I get started, I'd also like to thank Dr. Zimmer for being such a wonderful colleague and going above and beyond to help our patients. This is, uh, these are my disclosures. And these are disclosures for Dr. Zimmer. So this slide shows the outline of our talk. I'll discuss about transplant in brief and immune recovery after transplant and some of the factors that affect risk of infection. And Dr. Zimmer will discuss about prevention and treatment of common infections. So this slide lists sources of stem cells. Depending on the donor, a stem cell transplant could be an autologous transplant or an allogenic transplant where the source of stem cell is a donor. If the donor is an identical twin, it is called syngenic transplant. Stem cells can be collected from bone marrow, peripheral blood, or cord. The source of infection is called, or the stem cell is called graft. For allogenic stem cell transplant, the options for donor include sibling, unrelated donors who are often masked through NMDP registry, or international registries, haploidentical donor or half mass, children or parents, or cord blood derived from umbilical cord of a newborn. So this slide shows the process of transplant. Conditioning regimen refers to chemotherapy and or radiation that's given before transplant. Following the completion of chemotherapy and or radiation, stem cell is infused. Because of chemotherapy and radiation, 
blood counts go down. There could be complications related to chemotherapy or radiation. And in about two or three weeks, the blood count start to improve. Count recovery after transplant is often referred to as engraftment. And following engraftment, we continue supportive care antibiotics and other medicines to prevent and manage complications. We'll discuss more about immune recovery that can take a much more longer time period. So why do we perform a stem cell transplant? There are a few reasons. Stem cell transplant allows use of high doses of chemotherapy that can kill cancer cells. That's the main reason for performing an autologous stem cell transplant. In case of allergenic transplant where stem cells are collected from donor, donor stem cells can work as immune therapy and kill cancer cells as well. And stem cells from healthy donor allow recovery of normal hematopoiesis. Some of the broad group of complications following transplant include low blood count or cytopenias from chemotherapy and radiation, risk of infection, which will be covered in more detail during this webinar. Other complication of chemotherapy, such as damage to the lining of mouth and gut or organ damage, um, those are the main complications. Now, there are two unique complications of allergenic stem cell transplant. Those include graft rejection, which means the blood counts do not recover after a stem cell transplant. And this is the result of uh, patients' immune cells killing the stem cells from the donor. The second complication is graft versus host disease, where the donor's immune cells attacks patients' normal tissues. And it can result in an early form of complication called acute graft versus host disease or a later form called chronic graft versus host disease. We do use immunosuppressants, medicine that suppresses immune function to prevent both graft rejection and graft versus host disease. Some of the common medicines include tacrolimus, mycophenolate mofetil, methotrexate, serolimus, and ATG. So immune recovery can take many months for a patient who has undergone autologous transplant. Immunity may not return back to normal or close to normal until three months or so. For allergenic transplant, it can take a year or more for immune recovery. And the reasons for this are because of complications of chemotherapy, use of immunosuppressive medicines, graft versus host disease, and other complications. And slow or poor immune recovery can result in infections as well as they can increase the risk of subsequent cancers. There are several factors that affect immune recovery, including factors that happen before transplant and factors that happen after transplant. So before transplant, the choice of stem cell source, the amount of stem cells or cell dose in, in the uh, graft, the type of chemotherapy and use of certain medicines such as um, ATG can affect the chances of uh, immune recovery. For example, um, if ATG or antithymocyte globulin is used, oftentimes patients have slow recovery of their lymphocytes. After transplant complications, including organ complications, uh, damage to liver, kidneys, infections, graft versus host disease, or a relapse of underlying cancer can affect immune recovery. Both graft versus host disease as well as treatment for graft versus host disease can certainly affect the speed of immune recovery. Now this slide shows recovery of various types of immune cells over time. So the vertical axis looks at how close to normal have the cells recovered and the 
horizontal axis shows time it takes for immune recovery. Certain type of immune cells such as NK cells can recover a bit faster after transplant. However, various type of lymphocytes can take months or years to recover in the absence of graft versus host disease. Graft versus host disease can further delay recovery of some of these um, immune cells. So let's talk about risk of infection following transplant. There are several factors that affect risk of infection after transplant. The broad categories include organ dysfunction or complications, um, damage to various organs, exposure to certain pathogens um, and the nature of pathogens and overall a net state of immunosuppression. So mucositis or damage to the lining of mucosa, skin damage, damage to kidney or liver, they can increase the risk of infection. Certain pathogens are more likely to cause infection than others. Uh, various factors that affect immune recovery, as we discussed, can affect the risk of infection. Um, low blood count, including neutropenia, um, can also increase the risk of certain infections. So this slide looks at the risk of infection based on time from transplant. So the first phase is pre-engraftment where the blood counts are still low. Oftentimes there is neutropenia because of chemotherapy or radiation. There could be damage to the lining of uh, mucosa, lining of mouth or gut, um, skin damage. Oftentimes patients still have a central venous access device. So because of these factors, there is an increased risk of certain type of bacterial infection, such as gram-negative rod. Um, when neutropenia is prolonged, meaning neutrophil counts are low for a long time, there is an increased risk of candida infection or mold such as aspergillus. After the blood counts recover, the risk of some of these infections goes down. However, with acute graft versus host disease, there is a risk of other type of infection. Um, viral infection can happen during uh, any of these times in general. However, cytomegalovirus or CMV, we often see reactivation of CMV um, during the second phase when blood counts have uh, improved. Um, acute graft versus host disease, again, suppresses uh, immunity and increases the risk of infection. The late form of graft versus host disease or chronic graft versus host disease results in increased risk of infection with what is called encapsulated bacteria, pneumocystis, and if there is use of high doses of steroids for treatment of graft versus host disease, that can also increase the risk of uh, uh, fungal infection. And singles or varicella joster can also occur during the late phase. And most transplant centers utilize various medicines to reduce the risk of these complications during different phases of transplant. So what are some of the common sources of infection after transplant? Oftentimes, colonizing organisms that, can, uh, that are on the surface of the skin, gut, can become opportunistic infection when the immunity to fight back is low. There could be reactivation of latent infection, meaning many uh, people in the United States are exposed to CMV, but with immuno, uh, immunosuppressed uh, state, CMV can reappear in blood. Donors are regularly screened for a number of different type of uh, infection, but in, in theory, there is some risk of donor-derived infection. Infection can also be uh, caught from a hospital or in the community. So as we have discussed, chemotherapy can cause uh, damage to the lining of mouth, gut, or skin that increases the risk of infection. And um, there are a number of bacteria and fungus in our gut, um, on our skin, um, as well as uh, some candida in our lung, 
that can cause infection as well. So now Dr. Zimmer is going to talk about some of the infections prevention and management. Thank you, Dr. Zimmer. Thank you, Dr. Bott. As Dr. Bott was mentioning, during the period immediately following chemotherapy, while neutrophils are low, patients are at particular risk for infections due to bacteria that can live normally on um, someone's body and don't cause problems in a patient with a normal immune system. But when they break down the lining of the GI tract, bacteria that live in the bowel can uh, transverse into places like the blood where it should not be. Symptoms of infection in neutropenic patients are often much more subtle, meaning sometimes they won't have pain, um, even though they have an, an infection um, somewhere in their abdomen. They may not have a lot of respiratory symptoms initially um, it, with a developing pneumonia. And so in this situation, we treat fevers in a patient that's neutropenic and has recently received chemotherapy as um, a likely infection until further workup and information can be gathered. So febrile neutropenia is a special situation in cancer patients. Um, it de its definition is when patients that have an absolute neutrophil count or a neutrophil count of 500 or less or anticipated to have a count of 500 or less after recently receiving chemotherapy and have a temperature of greater than 100.4 that's sustained for an hour, or a one-time fever of 101 uh, degrees Fahrenheit or greater. When we see um, patients with febrile neutropenia, about half of those patients we actually don't find an infection in, but that information we won't have at the time of presentation. We have to wait for our diagnostic studies to um, be resulted. Patients that do end up having an infection with um, fevers and neutropenia, about 10 to 20% will actually, 25% will have an infection in their bloodstream, meaning they grow um, a bacteria infection um, in blood cultures, which is one of the most important diagnostic workup that we do when we evaluate these patients. Other patients may have a clinically documented infection like a fever or um, bowel infection that is causing their fevers. One of the problem um, areas that we sometimes can see um, being a source of infection is the central catheter site. That's why we are always very careful when we access um, the catheter, when we administer fluids or medication, scrubbing the hub with disinfectant. That's why when we change these dressings, we do so under a sterile um, process because we know that bacteria live on the outside of everyone's skin um, and the catheter provides an entryway um, from the skin into the bloodstream. And so as much as possible, we want to keep the site um, sterile where the catheter um, en enters and where medication get administered. Um, and so it's very important that untrained patients don't manipulate the catheters themselves and alert their um, medical team if there's a problem with their catheter. Um, and then the other common place that we see infections come from after chemotherapy are actually, um, as Dr. Ba mentioned, bacteria that live in the mouth or lower GI tract um, translocating into the wall of the GI tract or into the bloodstream causing um, potential sepsis. Uh, yeast, such as Canada, also live in these areas and so that's the place where fungal infections can arise from. Um, patients that have undergone allogeneic stem cell transplantation, um, especially those that have subsequent graft-versus-host disease requiring um, treatment with steroids or other more intensive immunosuppression, the most common type of um, fungal infection that we've seen after looking at this on a large um, national level is actually mold infections. The most common mold that causes infections after allogeneic stem cell transplant and in patients receiving chemotherapy is a mold called aspergillus. That mold is present um, in the environment. It's present on uh, decaying material. It's in the soil. And so um, there's not a great way for patients to avoid coming into contact with it. The next most common type of fungal infection that occurs after stem cell transplantation is candida infections. We'll talk about medications that we use to prevent these infections, but Canada historically um, has been much more common. We just use medicine to prevent 
those infections from occurring. And so those rates have drastically reduced as a result. And Canada is one of the organisms that normally lives on our body surfaces and in our GI tract. This is um, a diagram that depicts how um, fungal pneumonias or mold pneumonias occur. And so, um, as I mentioned, Aspergillus is the most common of these organisms, so I'm going to use it as the example pathogen. But um, it produces these tiny spores um, where it lives and grows in the environment that are then aerosolized or brought up into the air. Um, you and I and everyone, um, when we inhale, especially um, dirt or dust particles may be inhaling um, tiny fungal spores. In patients with normal immune systems, it kind of stops there. The body's normal immune system naturally um, gets rid of those spores and don't allow them to grow. In patients that have recently received chemotherapy prior to transplant and have low um, neutrophil counts, there is an opportunity for those um, canidia or, or spores to start germinating in the lungs and they can cause um, infection um, at the small airway level. Um, and if they're allowed to continue to grow, the immune system doesn't recognize and, and respond to them, they actually can um, invade into to tissues and cause a serious infection. Once neutrophil counts recover um, in that kind of post-engraftment phase, that middle, middle phase that Dr. Bott referred to, viral infections become a much more common um, entity um, because the lymphocyte and cellular immunity um, takes much longer to recover. And those, that facet of the immune system is what controls and responds to a lot of these viral infections. The most common virus that we're going to talk that we see in our post allo transplant patient population, and one we're going to focus on a little more today, is cytomegalovirus or CMV. Other viral infections that we see after transplant include um, Epstein Barr virus, the viral infection that causes mononucleosis, um, PK virus, which is typically a urinary um, disease. Um, it can also often cause um, bloody urine in patients that have received stem cell transplantation. HHV6 is an unusual pathogen, but is the cause of the slap cheek um, viral infection that we see in young children, the febrile rash illness. And then adenovirus um, is another common infection that we see in patients, especially with uh, graft-versus-host disease that require a lot of immunosuppression. Um, so a little bit more about CMV, cytomegalovirus, because it's um, probably one of the more common infections we see after allogenic stem cell transplants. And people outside of that um, world don't think too much about uh, CMV or cytomegalovirus. And so it actually is a very common infection worldwide, um, especially here in the US. If you checked um, response or previous um, evidence of infection in the US adult population, we find that 60 to 80% of US adults have had the infection at some point in their life and therefore have some immunity to that virus. It is a member of the herpes virus family. And so like the other herpes viruses, like the um, herpes simplex, the varicella zoster uh, virus, once you acquire that infection, the infection never actually clears from the body. It establishes a dormant phase in certain tissue types. Um, that can reactivate during periods of very intense immunosuppression like stem cell transplantation. Um, the infection also can be shed periodically, asymptomatically in bodily fluids, so it can be acquired through exchange of saliva um, and through sexual intercourse. Um, young children um, are much more common to come into contact with CMV, especially kids that go to daycare, are sharing toys and, and food with other children, um, and so they, we think that a lot of um, people get the infection as a young child and then have immunity moving forward. It can be a cause of mononucleosis illness in um, young adults or teenagers as well. It's the second most common cause of mono uh, next to EBV. Um, and what we worry about in the post-transplant patient is the way our, we suppress the immune system with treatment or prevention of graft-versus-host disease and the time it takes the um, immune system to recover CMV does frequently um, reactivate or become active after transplant. Occasionally, it actually can also be transmitted with the uh, donor stem cells. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that risk in a minute. 
And so patients that are at higher risk for, risk for CMV are those that have um, a positive IgG for CMV. That test tells us that the immune system has immunity against CMV and so that that infection has occurred at some point in that patient's life. And so the highest risk scenario um, is when the patient has prior infection um, and has that latent virus elsewhere in their tissue, especially if they receive a transplant from a patient or from a donor that is CME negative, meaning the new marrow and new um, T and B cells have never had exposure to the CME virus and so need to learn how to respond to that infection all over again once they um, start to mature and recover. Um, there is, like I said, a chance that the CMV virus can be transmitted with the donor cells, but luckily the donor cells already have some immune response to the virus. And so we don't see as uh, significant infections typically occur in that scenario. Patients that are also um, at increased risk for CMV infection and frequent CMV um, reactivation are those if they have any um, degree of mismatch um, with from their donor, couple identical transplants, meaning a half matched donor, um, cord blood recipients, if they receive T cell depletion um, prior to transplants or medication that suppresses T cell recovery post transplant, and patients that have significant graft versus host disease requiring high dose steroids. So we have a lot of um, ways that we, um, a lot of approaches that we um, have employed to try to prevent uh, these common infections in the post-transplant population. Um, so one, as Dr. Bott mentioned, we screen for um, specific types of infection in donors and recipients prior to um, proceeding with transplant. We reduce immunosuppression as much as possible. Um, it's a fine balance because we don't want to be too aggressive with uh, weaning and stopping immunosuppression to um, create increased risk for graft versus host disease. We use different antimicrobial prophylaxis to prevent the um, medication response of infections that we see commonly. We employ preemptive monitoring, and that basically means, well, we don't use prophylaxis specifically for um, a type of infection. Usually this is employed with CMV. Um, so our prophylaxis medication doesn't help to prevent that infection. We monitor blood levels to look for early evidence of infection and treat it early before it becomes a big problem. Um, and then finally, vaccination is a very important component to preventing infection in our post-transplant populations. So this is a, a busier slide, but I wanted to give you kind of an idea of what types of antimicrobials that we use um, after transplants. Um, patients are sometimes surprised by the amount of new medications they um, get to start taking after their transplant period, in the, especially in the early period. And so we do, um, our center typically uses antibiotics um, and other center protocols will vary based on where you're at and, and their experience and chemotherapy agents that they're using. But we use an antibiotic called um, fluoroquinolones or levofloxacin during the neutropenic period when patients are at highest risk for that um, bacteria that lives in their gut um, from getting out of the GI tract into the bloodstream. And we find there's a lot of evidence that suggests um, it does prevent episodes of bloodstream infections and fevers in the post allo transplant population. We use another antibiotic to prevent fungal infections. Um, we use Bactrim to prevent a fungal infection called pneumocystis that would be otherwise a very common um, cause of pneumonia in this population. And then some centers may or may not use additional penicillin prophylaxis for a period of time after transplant to prevent um, streptococcus pneumoniae, which is one of the most common causes of bacterial uh, pneumonia and meningitis in adults. And we do vaccinate for that um, uh, bacterial infection following transplant as well. We use antifungal prophylaxis. Um, typically our center and a lot of centers employ um, fluconazole to prevent infection from the yeast infection, the candida infection that lives in your mouth and the rest of your GI tract as well as your skin. In certain circumstances and certain protocols, um, they may use what's called mold active antifungal therapy to specifically prevent that aspergillus mold infection. And those um, pill options are usually posaconazole or voriconazole to prevent um, those infections. We typically use them in our allo patients that require high-dose steroids for graft-versus-host disease, um, and I'll show some data on that in a minute. 
Um, then we also employ antiviral prophylaxis. So until about two years ago, um, there weren't really very good options for prophylaxis against CMV. Valgancyclovir is the only other oral um, antiviral agent that's uh, currently available to prevent and treat CMV, but it has what's called some myelosuppressive properties, so it can um, impair the bone marrow development and, and formation of new um, white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets, which obviously we don't like at this period of time. However, about two years ago, a new antiviral medicine became available, latirmavir, and so we do employ that agent for prevention of CMV in our higher risk patient populations. Otherwise, most patients receive acyclovir prophylaxis to prevent um, reactivation from the oral herpes, HSV-1, um, HSV-2, and, and uh, the shingles virus, the Zaster uh, virus. And so this is a um, graph just demonstrating um, who tends to get invasive or mold infections in the highly immunocompromised patients, patients that have received transplants and are on high dose steroids for severe graft versus host disease. And we do find that in these settings, um, posaconazole is beneficial in preventing aspergillus as compared to fluconazole alone. Same thing with um, CMV in the high risk patient population, those that um, have uh, our CMV positive recipients um, compared to um, placebo patients that receive acyclovir prophylaxis alone, um, latimavir does cause um, a reduced rate of reaction, reactivation in the early periods post-transplantation. As I mentioned, another very important component to prevention, preventing infections after allo stem cell transplant is vaccine, vaccines. One of the most um, important vaccines, in my opinion, is the flu vaccine. Um, we recommend that patients receive these um, every year period, but especially um, in the early years post-transplantation and that all their family members receive the flu vaccine as well. In addition to the flu vaccine, there are um, a number of recommended vaccines that are um, started, usually around three to six months post-transplantation. Um, some of these are vaccines that patients would have received as a child or even as an adult, but we recommend starting over on those protocols as the immune system essentially has to relearn how to respond to um, and prevent infections. And so uh, recommended infections include a series of the uh, deep tap um, vaccines to prevent uh, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, the H influenza vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccine series, um, hepatitis A and B, um, meningitis vaccine, especially in patients that are um, in highly populated settings, so like college dorms, military barracks, um, patients that are at higher risk, we certainly recommend that. Um, the flu vaccine yearly, this is the injectable flu vaccine. The uh, nasal um, flu vaccine is a live vaccine and we don't recommend it in the early post-transplant years. We also recommend the um, recombinant shingles vaccine, the um, Shingrips, which is no longer a live vaccine and very effective in preventing shingles. And then in um, at-risk populations, the HPV vaccine, as well as the inactive, in inactivated polio vaccine in all patients. In terms of live vaccines, it's actually not a contraindication to receive live vaccines at any point post allo transplant. We typically remind recommend waiting until two years post-transplant and until patients are off immunosuppressive therapy to give the MMR series as well as the varicella vaccine if they've never had chicken pox before. Um, other things that um, we counsel our patients on um, to try to reduce uh, risk of infection once they get home, hand hygiene is probably the very most important thing that you can do frequent hand washing, carry a bottle of um, hand sanitizer in your pocket, in your purse, in your car. Um, that's what I do personally. And um, I think especially in the current times, um, hand hygiene is, is essential anytime you leave your house. Um, also currently recommending wearing a mask anytime you leave your house and are going to be around um, people outside your immediate household. Um, be careful in acquiring new pets when you are in the post-transplant period. Young puppies, uh, kittens can have certain types of infection that can make transplant patients very sick. 
we recommend that you do not change the litter box in the first couple of years post transplant and until you're off immunosuppression therapy and try to avoid getting scratched or um, bitten by any of your, your pets. I would not recommend acquiring a new bird or rodent or snake or turtle during the post transplant period as they can also be sources of um, serious infections in, in transplant patients. We don't recommend that you do um, heavy duty gardening yard work in the first um, years post transplant until you're off immunosuppression. When you do, we recommend um, wearing gloves, protective clothing so that you won't get um, uh, punctured by um, plants or thorns um, and that you use precautions if you're going to be aerosolizing a lot of dirt to prevent exposure to those fungal spores. And so wearing a, a workman's mask, um, like an N95 work mask would be um, very helpful during that, those activities. Referring to the FDA uh, website to make sure that you are cooking your food to the appropriate temperature, getting rid of leftovers after 48 hours so you can try to reduce the um, likelihood of foodborne illnesses. And then if you're going outdoors, use um, bug spray, protective clothing to prevent uh, tick and mosquito bites. So treatment of infections. Um, First of all, when we evaluate a, a post-transplant patient for infections, it's important that someone does a thorough history and physical exam to evaluate for um, possible sources of infection. Um, based on that workup, we do symptom-directed testing, which may include um, blood cultures, cultures from the urinary tract, um, sputum, depending on symptom onset and, and presentation. We may do some blood tests to look for um, evidence of infection due to bacteria, fungus, or viral infections. If they have diarrhea, we can do testing on, on stool samples. We might do x-rays or CAT scans um, to get, get a better look at um, involved areas um, based on symptomology. And then I think it's very important that um, the hematology bone marrow transplant team has a close working relationship with infectious diseases. Um, our center here is a very collaborative effort and um, they're always uh, appropriate to, to get me involved early on so that I can help direct some of this um, work up in treatment. So bacterial infections. As I mentioned, febrile neutropenia is um, often one of the presenting symptoms of a bacterial infection after chemotherapy. And so it's imperative that if you have fevers when you have a low white count that you notify your treating team immediately. We recommend that we get blood cultures and start IV antibiotics within the first hour in most patients. Um, the antibiotics that we use kind of depends on the individual center and the resistance rates of different types of um, bacteria that we commonly see. But usually this is an IV antibiotic like cefepime, ferprosil and tazobactam, or mirapenem or imipenem. We pay attention to history of infections when we're choosing therapy um, because we know if we don't treat the correct infection, the outcomes may not be as good. Um, in terms of viral infections, um, treatment options are varied depending on the individual virus. We don't have as many antiviral agents as antibiotics. In some viruses, we just have not found an antiviral agent that is very effective to treat them. Oftentimes, um, when patients have viral infections, it's a marker that their immune system is not functioning correctly. And so we'll often talk to the hematology bone marrow transplant team and ask about um, possibly reducing the immunosuppression if possible. We do have antiviral agents that treat um, cytomegalovirus, valgancyclovir, gancyclovir are usually the first line um, agents. And we watch to make sure those CMV levels start coming down um, following um, treatment. Usually they don't start to decline um, until about a week or 10 days after starting antiviral therapy. For HSV or shingles, um, it's usually acyclovir or valacyclovir. RSV is a special um, viral infection that can cause very severe um, pneumonias in patients that have received aloe stem cell transplants. In, it's also an infection commonly seen in young children and older adults. And so um, unlike the regular population, the patients that are not receiving chemotherapy, stem cell transplants, we might and um, 
consider treating with an antiviral agent called ribavirin and um, administering um, immunoglobulin, which is pooled antibodies from the general population to, to treat the infection and get control of the, the virus um, replicating earlier, as early as possible. BK virus, as I mentioned, um, is an infection that can occur after um, stem cell transplant. It often presents as like a UTI, so patients might have symptoms of burning. Often they'll also notice blood in the urine. There is some debate about using an antiviral agent called cytofavir, um, either that's instilled directly into the bladder or given through the IV. But most patients we end up um, treating with supportive care, meaning um, pain med management to make sure the urinary symptoms are not severe. Some patients will develop large clots in their bladder and are unable to pass them on their own. Those patients often require placement of a special catheter in the bladder that helps to um, flush out the, the clots from the, the urinary tract and make sure that the urine is not prevented from, from exiting the urethra. EBV, um, or the mononucleosis virus, has been associated with increased risk for what's called post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. It basically is a setting where um, the B cells um, have um, rapid replication in a clonal fashion. So it's almost like a um, early lymphoma or hematologic malignancy that develops due to the impaired immune response. We actually use a monoclonal antibody that targets um, B cells to halt that replication called rituximab to treat that, um, that scenario and sometimes also requires treatment with traditional chemotherapy. There are some investigational therapies that are currently in the works, um, including using um, cells that have been engineered to respond to specific um, cells where the viruses replicate. Um, those have been fairly successful, but not all centers have the ability to offer them, and they are under research protocols typically. This is an example of um, a protocol used to treat cytomegalovirus or CMV. Um, and so different centers will have different thresholds to where they initiate antiviral um, therapy to treat CMV and stop latirmavir prophylaxis if the patient was on that. And lastly, fungal infections. Fungal infections are actually um, a difficult diagnosis to make. The diagnostic testing that we have um, are not as sensitive as for bacteria and, and viruses. And so they do not grow well in the microbiology lab and culture, and they grow much more slowly than bacteria. And so the picture there is a plate example of what a mold looks like growing in the microbiology lab. That usually will not grow for a week or two after a sample is taken, but often won't grow at all. And so we use different um, criteria to define um, how to diagnose a, a fungal infection. And so we first start with a host criteria, meaning someone that's at risk for developing fungal infections, like a bone marrow transplant patient that's on immunosuppression, microbiologic evidence, so either cultures or blood tests that demonstrate evidence of a fungus, um, and then um, radiographic evidence, so a CAT scan or chest X-ray that has features suggestive of a fungal infection. Um, Sometimes this will mean that if a patient has symptoms that are concerning for a fungal infection, the team will recommend um, a procedure like a bronchoscopy where they go down into the lungs with a camera and take samples of the fluid in the lungs. Um, they wash the, the, the lungs with fluid and sample that. Sometimes they will try to take a biopsy of certain um, concerning tissue. If they see the tissue on a biopsy, that's very helpful to make a diagnosis. Um, some of the other diagnostic testing just has limitations on sensitivity and specificity, meaning sometimes they won't detect um, a positive test if they truly have an infection, and sometimes there will be a false positive test when the patient does not have an infection. Um, and patients that are at higher risk for fungal infections after transplant are those that are older age, um, have graft versus host disease, that have um, people that have received treatment with mesenchymal um, stromal cells, if they have a female donor to a male recipient, and um, if they have a, um, 
What is the CIBJ? Uh, the transplant comorbidity index. So if they have a lot of other health health problems. Yes. Yes. So if patients have history of renal dysfunction, ki kidney um, or liver uh, disease, then they are at higher risk um, if they have multiple organ diseases. And then in terms of treating fungal infections, there's three main classes of antifungal therapy. The first, fluconazole, voriconazole, and posiconazole are agents that we use to both prevent um, fungal infections and to treat fungal infections, um, depending on the diagnosis. They're the only pill form of antifungal therapy. The mycofungin and caspofungin are usually utilized in the setting of um, a severe yeast infection, so yeast infection in the blood, or they could be used in combination with another antifungal agent to treat a mold infection. And then amphotericin B, or its um, formulations like liposomal amphotericin B, are usually used to treat invasive mold infections, the pulmonary um, or sinus mold infections, and they um, those last two classes are only administered through um, IV routes. So in conclusion, um, the immune recovery post-transplant is slow and variable depending on the other um, graft-versus-host disease diagnosis and immunosuppression and the individual. Um, the type of infection depends on the timing after transplant and the immunosuppressive therapy. Um, these infections are also influenced by the antimicrobial prophylaxis that we give, so we do reduce rates of infection um, with these agents, but sometimes it makes um, a setup for other types of infections to develop. Um, infections are common after transplant and can be serious, um, and involving the infectious diseases experts sooner rather than later is very important um, for serious infection. And um, I just want to emphasize the importance in collaboration with the bone marrow transplant team and infectious diseases specialties. Um, it's really important to have great communication and teamwork, which we certainly do here. And th this is the Buffett Cancer Center um, in Nebraska Medicine. We have a very nice Julie sanctuary, so just wanted to show that picture. Thank you so much, Dr. Bott and uh, Dr. Zimmer uh, for the wonderful presentation. We do have a few questions. Our first question is, what diagnostic workups can be done for FUO with no findings in blood culture? Yeah, um, I'll handle that one if that's okay, Dr. Bott. Uh, so fevers are a very nonspecific symptom. We always first worry about infection, but there are other non-infectious causes of fevers. However, there are many other diagnostic tests that we employ to evaluate fevers. So blood cultures are one of them. Um, the blood cultures will grow um, bacteria, common bacteria in the lab. There are some bacteria that do not grow well in culture, so um, sometimes we end up doing other testing to look for bacteria, especially if the patient has um, a radiographic or clinical concern for that. There is some um, genetic testing that we can do to look for certain types of bacterial and fungal infections. There are some blood tests as well that we can send to look for some of the fungal infections I mentioned, um, as well as some of the viral infections. We often do um, CAT scans, especially in patients that are um, neutropenic, um, knowing that they're not going to have a lot of what we call localizing symptoms or um, symptoms that might point us in the direction of what's going on. Um, and so there are many, many other tests that can be do, done to evaluate fevers, blood clots, graft versus host disease, um, recurrence of disease can also be symptom, um, can also manifest as fevers occasionally. Thank you. Uh, when do you start receiving vaccines after transplant? It does depend on the, the center's protocol as well as the degree of immunosuppression. In general, patients will receive vaccines starting at around three to six months after transplant. However, if they're on a lot of immunosuppression therapy to treat graft versus host disease. Sometimes we delay some of the vaccines to allow the immune system to respond to them better at a later date. 
Thank you. Our next question is, are there any measurements like CD4+, plus, CD8+, plus, NK cells, et cetera, that give an idea of how well the immune system is working? And this would be at two years or further out from transplant. So, uh, so certainly we can do tests like flow, flow cytometry in blood that gives us a sense of um, immune recovery. So that's certainly possible. Some centers routinely do it, um, others don't. Now, uh, that is one of the many things that um, influence the risk of infection as, as we discussed today. So we not only look at um, cell recovery, but whether they have other complication, whether they are on immunosuppressive medicine, as well as say, say in last two years, what has been the history like? Has there been recurrent uh, infections and so on? So those all give good idea, but certainly we can do flow cytometry to look at different type of immune cells. Thank you. Are male donors preferred as transplant donors? And if so, why? So uh, when we think about selecting a donor for a patient, we, we look at a uh, number of factors. Uh, some of the most important factors um, include whether they are mismatched or full mass. Uh, so uh, th that's one of the most important factors. The other very important factor is age of the donor. So uh, younger donors are preferred over um, older donors. Uh, there could be an exception in, in terms of uh, matched sibling donor, meaning um, many centers would still prefer matched older sibling over matched unrelated donor. So th these are two factors that have demonstrated to improve survival. Uh, and th there are a number of other factors which we take into consideration if we have more than one donor. So that those include um, ABO uh, match, CMB, and um, male versus female. So um, patients who are, uh, male, when they receive uh, stem cells from female, uh, there could be increased risk of graft versus host disease. Um, so that's one of the considerations, but again, uh, the most important considerations are uh, mats, whether they are full mats or not, and uh, donor age. Do we know why there's an increase um, risk of graft versus host disease? When, a, when it's a female donor to a male recipient? Yeah, that, that, that's a fantastic question. So there was a paper um, in a prestigious journal, Blood, um, a few years ago, which demonstrated that uh, when there is gender mismatch, there could be antibody. So when the men, um, uh, female donor um, could develop antibody against certain antigens in Y chromosome. Um, it seems like that, that's the reason why there is an increased risk of graft versus host disease. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Zimmer had mentioned about um, not gardening or limiting gardening for outside. What about house plants, inside plants? Are those something that, trans, that patients who are coming home after a transplant should consider removing from the household? Um, so in general, no, um, if patients are having, you know, they have a whole greenhouse in their home, that's not something I would recommend, but in general, small house plants, um, in a limited number are fine. Um, I wouldn't recommend like doing a lot of, um, stirring up of the, the soil or repotting, um, especially in the immediate stages post-transplant, but um, you know, watering your plants and using them on a limited scale is fine. Thank you. Uh, you had mentioned about diet. Um, and are there certain foods that patients should avoid that could potentially lead to an, inf um, an infection, such as like blue cheese or things like that? Are there certain foods that patients should avoid uh, after transplant? Yes. Um, great question. So, uh, 
in general, I would recommend not consuming any unpasteurized dairy products or other beverages. And so always making sure that the, um, any milks or cheeses that you consume are pasteurized and have been done so in a professional fashion. Um, I personally would not recommend having sushi during the heavily immunocompromised time period um, or eating at public salad bars, um, places where a lot of people may be touching the food and it's um, subsequently uncooked. Um, I also would refrain from, um, in general, consuming a lot of uh, deli meat, hot dogs, same thing we tell pregnant women due to the small um, risk of listeria that can be associated with salty meats that are refrigerated, um, unless you um, can microwave them to a steamy level or cook them. Thank you. Our next question reads, what precautions should a patient take if having intercourse or sexual contact to prevent some of the infections mentioned, which can be transmitted sexually? Absolutely. Um, so we do recommend that any sexual encounters post transplant are, that are not within a monogamous relationship um, or if there is a potential risk for history of sexually transmitted infections that patients use condoms um, to prevent the majority of these types of infections. If patients um, have never had genital herpes before and their, patient, their partner has genital herpes, that infection can be transmitted even without any visible ulcers and so just for patients to take caution um, in those types of sexual encounters. Condoms do help reduce the risk, but they're not perfect as genital herpes can break out outside or can be passed outside of the um, penis itself. Thank you. Uh, our next question reads, how long after transplant should you follow for a neutropenic diet until neutrophils go down to more levels or when you're off the uh, tacrolimus? We actually don't feel strongly about following a neutropenic diet period. Most of our hospital trays are um, not necessarily specially prepared for our neutropenic patients. If they're asking in terms of when to avoid sushi and um, foodborne illness, I would say until they're off immunosuppression. But they don't have to avoid like fresh fruits altogether um, at any period. Um, I would just make sure that they um, know who was ever cutting or peeling them or they do that themselves. Thank you. And our last question, does the type of transplant impact um, the greater risk of infection diseases such as you have a related match, an unrelated match, or a mixed match transplant? Yeah, the type of uh, transplants certainly um, affect the risk of infection. Uh, mismatch transplant, um, cord blood transplant, the risk of infection could be higher. Uh, the type of transplant also affects the risk of graft versus host disease. And um, if there is a difference in risk of graft versus host disease, then that would um, increase the risk of um, infection as well. So mismatch transplant, um, there is a higher risk. Um, haploid transplant or core blood transplant in, in general, they also seem to have higher risk. Uh, so there is difference based on the type of transplant. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bott and Dr. Zimmer for sharing your time today and your expertise with all of us. If you would like to watch this webinar at a later time, it will be available on our website within two to three business days. If we were not able to uh, answer your question today, you can send it to us in three ways. Send an email to help at aamds.org. Call our helpline at 800-747-2820, extension 2, or submit your question on our Facebook page. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, thank you for joining us today and making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. The AAMDSIF Medical Advisory Board and team are here to support you and your family as we have done for the past 36 years. This concludes today's program. Thank you again, Dr. Bott and Dr. Zimmer.
And thank you for the invitation. Yes, thank you.